Hello, everyone. I am very happy to virtually welcome you to the first edition of Beyond the Headlines. My name is Lenja Slierendrecht and I work for Studium Generale of Erasmus University Rotterdam. And together with uh, Dr. Etienne Auger and Rashid Gabdulakov, uh, we developed the idea to exchange thoughts over lunch break since we miss out on that short talk by the coffee machine in COVID times. So what is happening behind, beyond the headlines of the news? And what are the lesser known, but no less important changes that are taking place while we are working from home, um, surviving the pandemic? As a host of this first edition, we are honored to have Rashid Gabdulakov with us, and he will guide us the upcoming hour through the current situation in lesser known post-Soviet states. And if you, working, uh, watching from home, have questions or anything to add to the conversation, you can use the Q&A button below. And then uh, at the end, I'll try to ask uh, all of your questions uh, to our uh, speakers. So Rashid, I hereby hand over the lead to you. Lenya, thank you so much for this introduction. And I would also like to start uh, with a bunch of thanks. I would like to thank Dr. Etienne Auger for coming up with the idea actually, and Studium Generale in the face of uh, Willem and Lenya for accepting the idea and for being with us um, on this initiative. Um, I have been working with Etienne for four years now and uh, have to say that it's been a very inspiring journey and I hope that uh, more and more uh, professors can be as um, inspirational for people. I would also like to thank our guests. Today we are really privileged to have outstanding speakers presenting on um, cases and context in Belarus and Moldova. For We will begin in the alphabetical order. So we'll start with Belarus. And we are so pleased to have uh, Dr. Marielle Weiermars, who is an assistant professor and, uh, in cybersecurity and politics at Maastricht University in the south of the Netherlands. She's also a visiting researcher at the University of Helsinki. She conducts research on uh, Russian internet governance and its human rights implications on the technological innovation in Russian media, a very relevant issue currently. And even looking a bit beyond, uh, Mariela is a co-editor of uh, uh, Palgrave Handbook on Digital Russian Studies. It is currently in press as far as I understand, but one other edited volume that is out is Freedom of Expression in Russia's New Media Sphere, Routledge 2020, which is co-edited with Sara Lichtisari, who is a famous scholar from Finland. For uh, Moldova, we have our student, Adrian Pneska, who is from Moldova. And uh, I admire this young man. I got to know him three years ago, and I was just blown away by how much energy he has and how many things he is involved in. He is known for his political activism and social entrepreneurship. He is the founder of uh, I might butcher this one, Orasumeu Orasu NGO, which as far as I understand is my town, is in Kishinev, the capital of Moldova. And um, during the high school years, he developed several initiatives, among which is the campaign for night public transportation in the capital of Moldova. Also a campaign for architectural preservation of old heritage in Kishinev is also quite relevant to all, all post-Soviet spaces, uh, all post-Soviet states where uh, historical buildings unfortunately get demolished more often than necessary. He also campaigned uh, for participation of young people in decisions over budget and over budget formation. Uh, the list can go on and on, but he, he also served as an honorary member of the Council of the National Assembly. He assisted the mayor's office of Kishinev. He opposed the kleptocratic regime, quote unquote, of uh, Vlad uh, Plachetniuk. And now, finally, he's about to finish his studies at the er among all of these other achievements. So we will begin in alphabetical order. We will begin with uh, Dr. Malier, Marielle Weiermars, who will present Belarus. I will take over and I will present uh, the current political turmoil in Kyrgyzstan. And then uh, Adrian will close with Moldova, after which we will have some opportunity for questions from the audience. So thank you so much for joining this lunch. Please enjoy. And without further ado, I give, my, I give the floor to Mariela. 
Great, and thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to join this session. I'm very happy to be in such wonderful company as well. Uh, so uh, to start off with Belarus, Belarus, I think of the three cases that we're covering is the one that is most well known, that people have seen most in the headlines. Uh, so as I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with, there have been ongoing protests ever since the falsification of the presidential elections that were held on 9 August. And in these elections, uh, Lukashenko claimed to have uh, reached 80% victory, uh, which according to the voters does not correspond to reality and also according to independent observers. So these protests have been quite remarkable for several aspects. Uh, firstly, by their unprecedented scale for Belarus. So they have been really massive and continuous, but also in their geographical spread. So this is happening not just in the capital Minsk, but actually across Belarus. And this is quite exceptional. Uh, but also some early research findings. So as you know, research tends to take a long time. So this is all based on very preliminary findings that scholars have shared. Uh, so from the Mobilize project, uh, they indicate that uh, they have also been remarkable because 70% of the protesters, especially in the early days, they did not participate in any protests before. So this is the first time that they are actually protesting, which means that these uh, events are really tapping into uh, sentiments uh, and uh, populations that did not protest any time before. And also, especially during the first month, many of them joined the protest by themselves. So not with family or friends, but they joined the protest alone. So if we look at the response from the Belarusian government, then we see that this has been one of very excessively violent repression and intimidation. And I'm sure you have seen uh, video footage of the extent of repression and extent of violence that has occurred. So there are massive, massive arrests, massive uh, violence as well. And increasingly, we've seen that this repression is targeting journalists. So many journalists have now also been detained and uh, of course, the foreign journalists had already been uh, either ousted from the country or they had their accreditation retracted. So in order to break up this protest movement, especially in its early days, the government also resorted to very extensive periods of internet shutdown. So in an attempt to disrupt communication, hoping that this would then stifle the protest movement itself. So in attempts to make sense of all of these events that are so unusual, uh, many commentators have highlighted the role of an encrypted messenger called Telegram. And this is a messenger that is popular in most uh, or many post-Soviet states, uh, but also in some authoritarian states such as Iran, because it allows for safer communications. So communications between you that are encrypted. And in Belarus, even during these periods of internet shutdown, Telegram continued to function for most users. And this is because they have uh, perfected their circumv circumvention methods uh, because they have been trying to circumvent efforts from the Russian government to block the app for two years. So Belarus in that sense has been benefiting from the fact that Telegram has perfected their technical baseline. Uh, so Telegram was still available most of the time for most users, uh, but more importantly, it is easy to use. So you do not need to have very advanced technical skills uh, it is very easy. And for instance, you could also use a VPN connection to try and circumvent internet uh, restrictions, uh, but that is more complicated to do. Uh, so what we saw is that the number of subscribers to Telegram channels, so channels that share information, for example, about protest location or to, to share help or where you can find resources, that the number of subscribers to these channels this swelled massively. So one example of a channel that suddenly became very, very popular is Nechta. But many commentators, because of this, they then very victoriously claimed that the events in Belarus, they surely are a telegram revolution. So in a piece that I've written together with several colleagues, so with Alexander Herasimenko, Tatiana Lokot and Ola Onuch, uh, we argued that if you single out a single digital tool or digital tools uh, in principle, and say that they are the main driver of mobilization, that this is overly simplistic. But more importantly, this can then result in drawing wrong conclusions about why people actually joined the protest, how protests are evolving. And as a result, we might also misinterpret which direction they are taking. So in this respect, there are also many lessons to be learned from the so-called Facebook and Twitter revolutions of the past. And within scholars who study social movements, this has been done. So for example, during the Arab Spring, it was uh, initially said, well, these are Twitter revolutions. 
Uh, but by now we know that that is actually a misrepresentation of reality and perhaps also giving these uh, platforms a bit too much credit. But more importantly, if we just single out digital tools and especially if we single out one particular platform, what it does, it overlooks the role of the actual protesters. So they are the ones who very creatively use all available resources in order to mobilize. And they're also the ones who accept the tremendous personal risk in doing so. So as is clear from early research into these Belarusian protests, at moments when the internet was down, protesters used whatever was available to them. So for example, they also plastered the walls of apartment blocks with printed leaflets, sharing news and sharing images of police violence, and sharing information about planned strikes, but also sharing information about how to set up a VPN connection, for example, so sharing instructions. Uh, we also know that the Belarusian diaspora, so Belarusians living abroad, they played a very active role both in collecting information and sharing it back into Belarus, as well as in attracting and maintaining international attention for the events as they were unfolding and especially also the extent of repression. So in this article, uh, we also quote some initial results from a large scale survey that was conducted by the Mobilize Project. And for example, what they show is that 60% of the protesters who were surveyed, they report that at the moments when the internet was down, they relied solely on word of mouth. So 60% for most of the early days, they relied on word of mouth. And of those who joined after August 10, so after two days, more than 80% joined the protest after they had seen protesters on the street. So they very strictly respond to seeing the protests occurring outside of their window. So what the outcome of all of this, so of the protests in Belarus is still very uncertain. Uh, so we see tactics are changing, but at the same time, the protest continues. Uh, it does appear that they are already inspiring for the restrictions of civil rights across the region. And I think that this is quite uh, disconcerting and something we should pay attention to. So I will just take the example of Russia, so the, the example I know best. So what we've seen there is that in recent weeks, there has been a series of proposed legislative measures that would further stifle civil society and that also forego the further restriction of internet freedom. I will just mention a few examples. Uh, so first, there's a draft law that's currently being considered that would further expand the foreign agents law. So this is a law that has been in place already since 2012. So if this law would be adopted in its current draft, it would mean that now all individuals and groups, so all individuals and groups that receive funds from abroad would be considered foreign agents. Uh, and you can imagine uh, that this is not a current category you want to belong to. But it also stipulates that then these supposed foreign agents would be banned from working as a public servant, and they would also be banned from having access to confidential documents. Uh, interestingly, they also stipulate that foreign journalists who are accredited to work in Russia would also be uh, fall under the number of foreign agents and have to present themselves as such. Uh, a second one uh, development is that Russia has quite a long-standing tension, tension relationship with foreign platforms such as Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. So they are largely accessible in Russia. Uh, but now Russia is, uh, is openly and formally accusing these platforms of censoring online Russian media. So they are not very happy with some moder moderation decisions from these foreign platforms that affect Russian media and their activities online. So there is also a proposed law targeting this and it would allow for imposing a fine or blocking access to these platforms on this ground. So if YouTube blocks RT, uh, then Russia has, is allowed to block YouTube in response. Uh, so in parallel, you also see other calls, so more informally, uh, that Russian businesses are called upon to move all of their online activities to Russian platforms. Now, this second measure, it should be seen in a much broader context uh, of Russia's effort to establish digital sovereignty. I'm sure you've heard of the, the Russian sovereignty law and so on. Um, well, oftentimes the attention goes to the infrastructure level of this, so actually being able to cut off the Russian internet from the rest of the world. It also is on the level of apps. So for example, it will soon be required by law that a given number of Russian apps comes pre-installed on the smartphone if it is sold in Russia, which is currently not the case. So of course we should keep in mind that uh, there are parliamentary elections upcoming in Russia, so they are scheduled for September next year. 
And these will obviously very, play a very important role in motivating the, these changes. But at the same time, the events in Belarus and especially how uh, mass scale they have been and how sustained uh, and the role that online communications have played in them, this certainly serves as an impetus to push these efforts forward. Now, a final point concluding on this, uh, I wanted to point out that uh, what happens in Russia uh, normally doesn't stay in Russia. This is from previous experience. And especially with Russian internet regulation, it tends to be very influential within the post-Soviet region. So for example, within Central Asia, you've seen various examples where Russian laws are copied more or less into local laws. So the ripple effects can be much more extensive. So on that, I will end uh, and also giving credit to some of the research that I have been quoting here. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to your questions afterwards. Thank you so much for this fascinating overview, uh, Mariela. And I will just continue for the sake of time with Kyrgyzstan. Um, and then we'll have room, of course, for Q&A and we will try to um, maybe just juxtapose some of these cases. So I'll start my demonstration here. Yeah. There is quite a bit to say, of course, and Unfortunately, time is limited, but you have to sort of build this kind of talk around something, especially when you have 10 minutes. And in preparation for the Beyond the Headlines initiative, I actually introduced this term, which has been tossed around in academic circles, but also in everyday conversations, Kyrgyzstan, the island of democracy. That is how it's been described for the sake of kind of, well, to put it in a nutshell, yeah, what is the country? Yeah, it is an island of democracy among autocratic states in Central Asia. So today I want to put this uh, term into question. I want to spotlight it, I want to question it, but I also want to run us through some of the events that the country experienced over the 30 years of its independence and to say, uh, how it's different from its neighbors, but also focus on the most recent coup, the overthrow of the government and the current ongoing turmoil and address the role of uh, social media in all of this. I should say that I, I haven't had a chance to introduce uh, myself. I'm a PhD candidate at Erasmus University of Rotterdam in the fourth and final year. I study digital vigilantism, which is citizen-led justice manifested online in Russia and in other post-Soviet states. So I want to start with, of course, in the audience, I, as far as I understand today, we have uh, different levels of knowledge or understanding of the region and the events in Kyrgyzstan specifically, which is great. So for those for whom it's repetition, I, I want to dedicate a couple of minutes to locating geographically Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, it is um, to the west of China, south of Kazakhstan, and so because of these kind of neighbors like Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, which are known for having had one or two leaders since the fall of the Soviet Union, Kyrgyzstan, of course, stands out. In what way? Well, the first president, Askar Akayev, who inherited power after the collapse of the USSR, uh, his regime fell in 2005 in a revolution or rather a coup d'etat. Afterwards, there was a president for one day issued by Kadrbekov, nobody knows him anymore. Uh, he was, again, he's just the uh, president for one day. Later came Kurmanbek Bakiev, and he's infamous for his uh, presidency, which is described with high levels of corruption, suppression of media, pressure of, on civil society. And he was also overthrown. He was overthrown in 2010. And him and his entourage fled to, of all places, Belarus, where they are located still. Interim president was Rosa Atumbayla, who was also um, the first female president in Central Asia. She took over the country in a dire state, in dire political, social, and economic uh, situation which was accompanied with inter-ethnic clashes in the south of Kyrgyzstan. And it's worth mentioning that the country is, uh, the regionalism is quite significant for political reasons as well. After Rosa 
Atumbayeva came Almazbek Atambayev, who served as president until 2017. He also, he is notorious for having put pressure on the media who he wanted to rely later on when pressure was being put on him. Uh, he also initiated some amendments to the constitution. And again, we see what uh, Mariela has mentioned that what happens in Russia does not stay in Russia. There was some inspiration from the Russian um, legislation over control of expression, self-expression on social media, uh, but also freedom of the press. Almazbek Atambayev put in place his protege, Sorombay Jimbekov, or endorsed and supported and did everything possible for Jimbekov to succeed and to become president. And shortly after, Jimbekov turned against Atambayev and later offered, ordered the state troops to storm Atambayev's residency and capture him. So he was detained. It's worth saying, maybe at this point, that during the most recent term, uh, coup in October, Atambayev was briefly released. He was released by his supporters from the GKMB detention center, which is uh, in the Soviet times, it was known as KGB, right? So safe security, safe security um, facilities. Uh, in this brief time that he was outside of his cell, he gave a few public speeches. There was also an assassination attempt. And then he later went back. And now the Supreme Court recently had hearings over him. And there are some uh, motions towards uh, granting him forgiveness. Sadir Japarov was also a prisoner, political prisoner, who uh, was released during the most recent coup, took over um, in a very controversial and questionable circumstances, took over leadership as interim or temp acting president of Kyrgyzstan, later announced that he is going to run uh, as one of the candidates in 60 plus candidates, registered candidates. Why 60 plus? Because some already take their uh, personas off the ballot lists. And since the 14th of November is succeeded by uh, Mamutov, by Talant Mamutov. So quite a bit is going on. Political actors are changing fast. Uh, but just to briefly run you through what has happened. So on the 4th of October, there were um, parliamentary elections uh, that people were not satisfied with. Basically, the results, which were accompanied with uh, bribes and buying over the votes from the people and all of these usual unfortunate uh, behavior, people took it to the streets in what was a peaceful protest. This is a picture taken by one of our professors from Kyrgyzstan, Nidia Tulegenov, who was at the square, among, among other people we know and, and admire in, in the capital and elsewhere in Kyrgyzstan, let's say. The protests went into the night, and at night, people, so from the night of 5th to 6th October, people stormed the White House for the third time in the country's history. It is referred to as the White House. Basically, it is a uh, state building where both parliament and president are taking office. So after the initial clash with state forces, who later retrieved, the people took over. They stormed the White House. You know, they set it on fire. A bit of looting was happening inside of the building. And uh, they forced Jean Bekov to re eventually resign. The building has seen a lot. I'm showing just some, some images that are circulating on media. Yes, this is beyond the headlines. Some headlines did include uh, Kyrgyzstan, this time without butchering the name into uh, Kazbekistan or Tajikistan, as has been in the past, unfortunately. Uh, but this turmoil of this school has led to, has continued in clashes within the uh, society and with political leaders agitating for. Um, different groups for their support. And this is where I want to also center a bit of my focus because there are divides that are happening in the offline domain that are also reincarnating in the online domain in Kyrgyzstan. So Japar, Sadir Japarov, he became kind of a martyr, a kind of a, a person who is a victim of political apparatus. That is how he perceived by his supporters. While he was detained or while he was serving time behind the bars, he lost his parents, his son died. So he is seen as this a person who has lived through great sacrifice, who is, who is now 
uh, going to stand up for people's rights. So th this is what his supporters believe, of course. And the supporters of Sadir Japarov are referred to as the orcs in the, at least in the Twitter segment of Kyrgyzstan. And Twitter is in Kyrgyzstan is its own universe. It can be described as kind of a public forum for Russophone intelligentsia. Uh, it is very clever, sarcastic, highly politicized. Um, recently also there has been by, by these intelligences who, it's worth mentioning, refer to themselves as Balkonsky. It's a, a reference to the characters in Leo Tolstoy's uh, uh, War and Peace. Balkonsky behind me is actually a painting of Bishkek. So it, it, the word originates in the word balcon, a balcony. People who usually look at the events happening in the country from the comfort of their balconies, but never actually physically participate. Uh, again, these are the Russophones, these are the uh, intelligentsia, highly educated people who now feel that maybe they should develop uh, discourse in the Kyrgyz language so that they don't live in their own bubble or rather expand some of the values and ideals beyond. So we have the orcs and then of course quite a few um, kind of sarcastic images circulated online as well. Uh, there are several Facebook groups that are designed specifically for this every day, they update different memes and so on. Uh, then there were also the Avengers, the heroes, the vigilantes. And in my own research, I usually view vigilantes uh, through the context of a negative prism. But in recent turmoil in Kyrgyzstan, this was one of the cases where people volunteered, basically served as a living shield to protect the city from looters amid the disappearance of law enforcement. The previous two revolutions, previous two coups were accompanied by severe looting, destruction of businesses and administrative buildings. This time around, people used telegram channels to coordinate, to help each other out, give each other car lifts, feed each other. Basically, we see where citizenry replaced the state. We see a complete overtake of state functions by the people. And this is not the first time Kyrgyzstan is experiencing this. During the COVID pandemic, pandemic and the peak of cases in the summer, people also had to rely on themselves in trying to solve this, um, trying to coordinate resources and help each other out. So we see a case where the living shield of people protected, people protecting state property, businesses, and public spaces from their own um, countrymen, countrymates, and they were referred to in social media as the Avengers, the heroes. Uh, this poster here says that everything is so bad that even Balkonsky took it to the streets. This was taken uh, last year by a friend who shared an image with me, and it was the reaction, protest, the reaction towards the widespread um, corruption and money laundering in the country and the uh, schemes that are taking place in the country's um, customs sector and so on. So already the protest activities had been happening, but once again, I would like to emphasize that there is a, there is a divide between the vision for the future of the country or between concerns. And of course, if the previous two revolutions, the 2005 one and 2010 uh, took place in the context where the social media was either uh, non-existent or a very small percentage of penetration as was the internet and mobile internet, then today's realities, we see that people can live broadcast what's happening on the street. And that also means that there are political influences. Amid all of this turmoil, a mysterious proposal for constitutional amendments appeared. Why mysterious? Because it's hard to locate who initiated the um, call for a state referendum to change um, the constitution. Interestingly enough, the, the original document was already once um, hard to physically locate in 2016 when Almazbek Atambayev initiated amendments. So even the physical document was difficult to locate once. Now it's hard to understand who is initiating the, the amendments and changes, but there is also no public sphere, no forum for people to discuss. What is the nature of these changes? Who is initiating them? How many are being proposed? Everything is sort of coming and going 
just like the acting presidents in the country. And the role of social media in this regard is also interesting because people are commenting in informal leaders are stepping up to put things in perspective for wider audiences. And depending on what position, political position you are taking, you can influence people's support or resentment of the proposed changes to the constitution. People have, and uh, I took these images from public groups in, on Facebook. Luckily, people are wearing uh, face masks, so I don't need to redact their faces. Um, among many creative posters and placards that are being used, I wanted to focus on these ones because they kind of, in my view, summarize what is happening. The first poster displays uh, Sadir Japarov, the person who was the prisoner, uh, the, who is portrayed as a kind of a the suffering political prisoner who can potentially take over the state and who's, who is linked, who is believed to have links to um, the organized crime groups in the country, hence the reflection of um, in the card that is used. Another proposal that is being discussed right now is the status of the Russian language, a highly politicized question as well whether it should have a status of the state language or not. Um, another placard is saying that uh, no to Han institution. So constitution, there is a play of words on Khan, basically like the, the king, yeah, the, the sovereign uh, that was present in Central Asia, Central Asia's history. And an interesting line, I want to want to remain in Kyrgyzstan. Basically, it's another signal that there is a layer in the society that if things go the way they go in uh, the way they're headed now in Kyrgyzstan, they might pack up their bags and depart. And of course, something for the English audiences during this protest: yeah, the constitution, democracy for working people, some kind of signs. So briefly, I want to focus on the, uh, the idea of the future. Things are changing rapidly in Kyrgyzstan. The new election dates are being proposed and taken down, and now. Parliamentary elections are postponed till the summer of 2021. Presidential elections are scheduled to January 10th, as is for now the referendum over constitutional amendments. And the country, so to revisit the idea that I began with, is it the island of democracy? My argument that is that it's neither nor. It's neither an island, yeah, I mean, it's a double, it's a, it's a landlocked country, but of course I know that it's a figurative speech, so jokes aside, it is not an island and it is not a uh, democracy. Rather, it is an island or space, Kyrgyzstan, what makes it different that political negotiation is possible and it can really go in any direction. There are different visions for the country B between all these groups that I represent, that I have outlined. There are the intelligentsia, the rural people, the Russophones, people who's, who can only speak Kyrgyz, people who have studied abroad, the creative class. And unfortunately, they all seem to live in their own bubbles. And this forum where people come to and can discuss things in consensus is not happening. It, it is replaced by social media, but within social media platforms, we see fragmentation. Each platform is used for a different purpose. And whether you speak Kyrgyz or Russian, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, there is no consensus and there is no desire to hear each other out and to come up with some kind of um, vision that could benefit everyone at the end of the day. Democracy is something that is complex, of course, and it implies the functionality of state institutions. It implies freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and unfortunately, uh, none of that is a characteristic of Kyrgyzstan currently. What it has is a strong and vivid civil society active voices that are active for now, uh, but there is a potential that these voices will be suppressed. There is also a potential. I mean, people see the role of uh, the language, the role of religion. It can be easily turned into a religion-focused state. It can, you know, some people might stand up for the preservation of secular ideals, and people need to think about different scenarios Having worked with Etienne Auger, I cannot uh, help it but think about the future. This is the exercise we do with students in the course International and Global Communication. And I urge um, civil society leaders, policymakers in Kyrgyzstan to think about future scenarios and to imagine the country that they want to live in 
and strength for building that. Uh, quickly, I like to share this one. Um, once Kyrgyzstan seems like a very far away place for people in the Netherlands, but it's even possible to go there by train. I will share a link to my story, but I don't want to take any more time. Thank you so much for your attention. And I now give the floor to Adrian. Thank you very much. Sharing my screen. Here we are. Can you say it? My. Uh, can can you see my screen? Great. All right. Um, so first of all, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you all on Beyond the Headlines, and I'm very thankful for including Moldova in this discussion because uh, in the last months Moldova has been on the spotlight of, uh, of many European and um, North Atlantic news by having the first woman president, by having after a long, long time of ambiguity and uh, going around both Russian and EU integration with not having a solid position. Now Moldova officially has a, pres a president supported by 58% of the country, which strives and aspires to the European Union. Let's see what were the mo main headlines after the um, elections two weeks ago. Most of the foreign press has focused on uh, on the fact that Russia has is um, that this election results have been a blow to the Russian regional, regional dominance, that um, uh, mostly pro-Russian president concedes and the pro-European um, pro Moldova is kind of closer uh, now than it was before. And that is partly true, but still as we are in an event that it is called Beyond the Headlines, uh, let's see what happened beyond the headlines and how was this victory possible. Can you maybe make your screen bigger? Yeah, like this. Perfect, thank you. Great. Um, in terms of how was it possible, uh, we believe there were mainly three factors that have contributed and have made this perfect storm for this victory. First of all was the diaspora participation, sad as it might be, but the bad things happening in Moldova in the last years, including the uh, theft of $1 billion from our bank system, which represented at the time in 2014, 12% of our GDP just in one night, which has uh, led us to a currency crisis and to the economic crisis, which is going uh, until present. Also, the present with the klepto with the problems with the kleptocratic regimes that has been very oppressive towards very active parts of our society have led lots of youngsters to flood the country to uh, to follow. Um, to follow the roads to the European Union to study just as I do here at the Erasmus University. Throughout the last five years, our diaspora has become very much bigger. And what we see in the, um, in the um, graph on the second side of the, um, of the screen is the diaspora participation in the presidential elections 2016 compared to 2020. Uh, and we're talking about the first tours. So in 2016, we've had uh, by the end of the election, 64,000, so that in 2020 we had 138,000 uh, plus um, people who went to vote in sections uh, um, across across Europe and uh, across the world. But still, it was the first two results. The second tour has shown a massive, uh, like a massive gain in the number of votes in diaspora, uh, which has led to 260,000 people voting outside of Moldova, which is an uh, a record, like by by uh, by all means, uh, which has also combined with a record low participation at voting in Moldova. What means that more and more people vote in diaspora and less and less people vote in Moldova. This has led to the uh, to just a striking victory for Maya Sandu, which is perceived as a candidate uh, for European integration and a candidate that did not make use of. Uh, uh, fake fake media and um, and uh, all of the tech political techniques that were used were claimly used on the other side by Igor Dodon. And we have seen that the incumbent president who has lost is very uh, was very sad about it that uh, the diaspora participates and he uh, he has recognized his faults in uh, communicating with diaspora. Um, but before that he was voting 
and has also in between the first two tours, uh, he has advocated for the uh, for the cancellation of the elections because the diaspora just couldn't vote this big, in his opinion. Uh, here we see some pictures of how the diaspora participation has looked like. Uh, uh, in the second, it's Frankfurt. And I remind you, this is, has all been happening two weeks ago, just amid the coronavirus pandemic. And people from all over Europe and the world have seen their role in participating in this elections and uh, went out to the section uh, to the voting sections, which were not mo not most of the times close to their homes. Uh, there were people had, that had to travel hundreds of kilometers to the uh, voting sections. Uh, so these are all photos taken around 9, 10, 9, 10 in the morning. Uh, and these photos are also credited as having a very big effect on uh, Maya Sandoz's victory. Because on Sunday, on the election day, when Moldova wakes up and uh, thinks about going or not to the uh, voting poll, uh, we have our social media was full of photos of our... Um, citizens from all around the world that were already waiting in lines to vote for the next president. And this, uh, this huge lines have led to the fact that at 5, 6 p.m., uh, more than 10 voting uh, stations did not have any more ballots. They have just, go, 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 they have just you know, uh, gone out all, all of their um, ballots that they had. And let's talk about why is the story relevant. Um, First of all, I believe it announces a new role of diaspora in homeland politics in Moldova, but also in a lot of post-Soviet countries that are struggling with, um, with fleeting youth. This is a trend that is going to come back in, in a lot of elections in the future. Also, what is interesting about the social media uh, and how the social media regulators and um, companies have integrated and um, used the Moldovan elections. In 2018, we've had a very famous case of Facebook versus the Moldovan government, where Facebook has come with an official report stating that the Moldovan government uh, not only finances, but also hosts in their building um, servers that have like hundreds of bot accounts spreading fake information about their government. And this has been officially posted by Facebook. So after since then, Facebook has had a very active stance in Moldova. And this was the first elections where they actually went on in a timely manner, deleting bot accounts, uh, reporting fake news, and uh, just making our threads uh, less, less looking like, uh, like they're lying to us. And for the first time, we've seen that using social media to spread fake news and manipulative data did help, but not to the extent it would, it would win the election for the incumbent president. Uh, in between the first two tours, uh, there has been a very big battle in between the two candidates, but one of the candidates, the one who eventually lost, has uh, has had a more aggressive campaign where he, um, he has advocated and promoted uh, messages which are just fake, just like if Maya Sandu wins, she's going to cancel the Russian language. If Maya Sandu wins, she's going to close schools and so on, just saying everything that is possible just to uh, make people vote less for her. Uh, the actual effect was that in Moldova, maybe less people have voted for Maya Sandu, but the people outside of Moldova have been motivated by this fake news to go and vote and, uh, and just uh, slam the incumbent president. And the, uh, the last conclusion, in a country where the main polarizing political element is centered around geopolitics, we're always in a struggle between EU integration or Russia and Turkey, who we should be more friends with, um, it is for the first time in Moldova's history that around 58% uh, vote for a candidate advocating for EU integration, which is a very bold statement, uh, which is for the first time in our history, as I said, which also announces and uh, harbingers a new chapter in our uh, European integration story, which of course is going to take a long time from now on. Um, yeah, I guess that's mainly it about the, uh, the Moldovan elections. Uh, this, this for sure does not mean that a new chapter of politics starts in Moldova, that as of tomorrow, we're starting a new path towards the European Union. Our parliament is still 70% occupied by pro-Russian and let's say kleptocratic or the uh, remains of the past kleptocratic regime, <clears throat> which in a parliamentary country just decides most of the things. So now the most important struggle and what is happening beyond the headlines right now is that the uh, president Maya Sandu is fighting for the um, 
repeated par parliamentary elections, which we hope will uh, will just bring in front of people a more valid parliament, in which we can trust. And uh, I'll use this uh, opportunity to invite you all to be our guest in Moldova. We have um, awesome wine, we have awesome food, and awesome experience for you to experience. Uh, so whenever you have the time after this pandemic, of course, be our guest. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adrian. I think I'll give the floor, the floor to Lenya now to coordinate the questions, correct? Yes, thank you very much. All of you, Maria Levayermans, Rashid Gabdulakov, and uh, Adrian Bleshka for your uh, interesting stories on uh, those countries. I actually have a, a question myself before I uh, uh, go to the questions of the audience, because there are some. Um, we have now heard your stories very specifically on those three countries, but are there similarities between those countries or, or uh, post-Soviet states in general? For example, in the search of identity or the search uh, for democracy, or are there other similarities maybe? Uh, I could maybe hop on in this. I, I also have thought that most of the post-Soviet countries do go on the same motives and we experience mainly the same problems maybe labeled in different uh, in different forms but the uh, the struggle of identity of finding what divides us rather than unites us is present all all around all around uh, uh, eastern europe and it is very uh, re regrettably to say but is mostly fueled by the russian press as we have held in the last years. So in Moldova, for the last elections, we have had a very big debate again on whether what's our language, Moldovan or Romanian, which is, you know, just an expired debate for a lot of years, but still people like to fuel it up just to divide the people. I think the very, um, I will echo uh, Adrian, that language, religion, relationship with Russia, relationship with neighbors, all of these things, of course, are present and uh, of course, depending on the region, there, there is a bit of a different packaging, but that is still present. Oftentimes, I'm, I'm, I'm told, you know, isn't this term a bit outdated, this post-Sovietism, right? Why do we even say post-Soviet states? Uh, but we should really now focus on this uh, and see whether we have outlived this with all the enthusiasm that we embraced independence in the 90s or whether what is post-Sovietism? It's the structures that are still present. It's the mentality that is still present. Uh, in some co contexts, it's even the political elites that are still from that era. So we haven't seen a complete renovation. Uh, we haven't seen a complete, um, uh, it's, it's not gone. I think it's ultimately present, both in institutions, in structures, and in some negotiations for identity that are present still. Uh, I will have to keep it short because otherwise the answer might take an hour, but language, religion, relationship with some of the um, greater powers around, all of these things matter. And final comment, there is, they will continue um, being on the agenda in the shift towards the digital domain. Who will come in with legislation? Who will come in with infrastructure? Who will we rely upon? Uh, that will be some very interesting developments to monitor. Yeah, I think I can, of course, echo some of the points that I've already raised uh, that I very much agree with. But at the same time, I would say that oftentimes they also obscure some more fundamental uh, problems, uh, which are connected to the fact that these were very much integrated systems in an economic sense, for, for example, uh, that had to be separated and then established firmly. You have to have the establishment of properly functioning institutions to be able to have a functioning democracy. Uh, so in, this is also a similarity, uh, which can then result in, for example, uh, not increasing living standards, which is a very fertile ground for, for protest. Uh, this also creates the, the fertile ground for uh, inciting religious differences, inciting ethnic differences, inciting uh, these conflicts with neighboring states. Uh, so I think we should always be careful to not uh, not underestimate, but certainly also not overestimate the importance of these uh, cultural differences, ethnic differences, uh, religious differences. 
Uh, at the same time, I think oftentimes in the, uh, the coverage of the region, uh, the countries are placed, are conceived to be uh, more similar than they are. Uh, so when we say post-Soviet, uh, we do have to keep in mind that Estonia is also post-Soviet, uh, Kyrgyzstan is post-Soviet, Uzbekistan is post-Soviet. Uh, so I think that we uh, would really benefit from trying to be more specific in terms of, yes, identifying those elements which they share, uh, which uh, means that they have found it more difficult, perhaps, to establish the properly functioning institutions that you need for democracy, while at the same time also acknowledging that even within Central Asia, these states are fundamentally different and that you really cannot uh, take the events that happen in one country and think they will happen in a similar way in the next. Uh, so I think we really need both, both approaches. One quick comment as well. After, I think, 80 days of protest by that time in Belarus, when in Kyrgyzstan, the people stormed and tackled the government in six hours. I think that raised some questions that even protesters in Belarus started saying, oh, hey, we should adopt the Kyrgy Kyrgyz style. Contexts are very different indeed. And you know, the Soviet Union stretched quite far. And of course, that would matter. One vivid uh, example is in Belarus, when people take off their shoes you know, to stand on the bench with their placards, and then you see people jumping over the fence and basically setting the state building on fire. Approaches are different, possibilities are different, contexts are different, of course. So I hear in all of you that it's better to look individually to the countries instead of zooming out and call it post-Soviet. So thank you for that clarification. I have a question from the audience by Iris de Graaf, and that is um, to Marielle, actually. Uh, she is uh, thanking you for the very interesting elaboration. And then she writes, you mentioned that a foreign journalist would be labeled in Russia as foreign agents if uh, there will be an, an expansion of the law. Is that a direct result of the protest in Belarus? Yes, it is a very interesting question. Also one that we, uh, we always find very difficult to actually prove. So we see events that happen in parallel, uh, but at the same time, it's really difficult to say if, without having insider knowledge uh, that this, uh, the one is really the result of the other. Uh, so in this case, of course, we have to acknowledge that the line of the development, the so direction this is taking, this is not really surprising. So it really builds upon what was already in place. It builds upon uh, what we already saw was developing over the past year. Uh, but at the same time, I think that the speed uh, that this is now developing, as well as the extent of the restrictions that they're proposing, I think this is quite uh, remarkable, or at least I did not expect it to, uh, that the proposed restrictions would be this extensive. Uh, so I think that there is certainly a connection here. Uh, of course, one thing I did not mention in the presentation, since I didn't want to uh, make this all about Russia, but of course we had the, the uh, poisoning of Navalny, uh, which is a case in and of itself. Uh, but I think that the events in Belarus certainly um, have uh, reinforced the idea that Navalny is indeed a, a political threat and that this national network that he has established of the regional offices, that this is a very fundamental political threat and that something has to be done. So I do think that there in that sense is a connection. Now, a one side note is that uh, what I was discussing, these are proposed laws that are now in the first reading and oftentimes laws are amended quite extensively and even when they are implemented, things can change. Uh, so I think we should also keep in mind that these are uh, not passed yet and we need to see what, uh, what will be the final form. Thank you. Uh, I have a question by Alexander Strelkov. He actually asked two, but I'll ask the question he has for Adrian. Uh, do you think that there is a similarity between Romanian and Moldovian this diaspora? And then he uh, writes that uh, that there in Romania are a lot of anti-corruption protests and that they were led by diaspora members. And can you reflect on that a little bit? Yeah, that is true. Uh, actually, a lot of the things that are now happening and the political changes that are happening now in Moldova are due to the Romanian policy, policy agenda. Uh, Romania in the last five, six years has been in a very active fight against corruption where people would take over the streets whenever the government would pass uh, a law that you know does not uh, does not earn uh, did not earn its uh, reputation and validity uh, so in moldova right now maya sandu has been elected president on a very firm 
ground and platform of uh, fighting against corruption and establishing um, a justice system that is uh, that works normally in Moldova. So there is a very big similarity in this sense. And uh, the people of Moldova have a lot of, like have a lot of opinions, of course, of what's happening in Romania, but still there they have been inspired by uh, by this and the Moldovan diaspora and the Romanian diaspora. I mostly find myself very complicated to divide those two. It's like people are just so similar, but of course, you know, uh, even in the same family, you have different people, uh, but people are very alike uh, in themselves and their political preferences has shown that that the uh, Romanian diaspora has made Klaus Johannes president in 2015, if I'm not wrong. And the Moldovan diaspora has made Maya Sandu president, both presidents from, uh, from a conservative right-wing European party, uh, which are striving for more European integration. And there's another question for you actually by uh, Monica Spelbrink. Um, she asks you, how did minorities in uh, Moldova vote, Russians, Caucasians, um, did they uh, support for Zandu? Uh, a lot of things changed in Moldova, but not our political preferences of the ethnic minorities. Uh, so the Gagawus people, which are a Turkish minority in the south of Moldova, kind of isolated. Uh, they have given 97% vote to Igor Dodon, to the... Um, to the Russian, let's say the pro-Russian candidate, even Volga Gawiza has been fled with hundreds of millions of euros in the last years by the European Union in different sorts of projects uh, like channels, uh, roads, uh, sub subventions to the agriculture and so on. But still, we have seen 97% uh, vote in Gawiza. And Transnistria, of course, this is a territory which is not controlled by the Moldovan states, but still Moldova. Um, still opens uh, voting stations across the, uh, let's call it border, uh, where people would come and vote. But what we've seen in the last 10 years is that most of the voting is not voluntary. So people are paid to, to, to go to vote and their transport is organized on buses. Uh, but the, you know, like the one change that we have seen in the Transnistrian voting in this time is that uh, their votes, their, there were like 30% of votes for Maya Sandu, uh, which means that even though a lot of people were, um, were corrupted to go to vote, um, like most of them, like a big part of them have still given their vote for Sandu. And uh, this just is, this is also becoming the new normal just because Transnistrian people are Moldovan people with Moldovan passports. And most of the exports in Transnistria are going to the European Union and none of it is going to Russia. So um, this, this, that part also, like, I guess, uh, hides some changes in the future. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question um, by Irina Gutu, if I pronounce that right. And she, uh, she writes, to what extent, and it's not uh, pointed to any of you specifically, so just uh, the one who feels like it uh, answered, to what extent people who protest uh, are representable, represent, or sorry, representational for the whole uh, Belarusian or uh, Kyrgyz uh, population, taking into account the uh, existing digital divide in these countries. Maybe Rashid can try to answer. Uh, sure, we have to differentiate between revolutionary forces, between constituency that are being that are trying to be won over, right, by different political forces, formal and informal leaders. And uh, what's interesting about Kyrgyzstan, again, that puts it in, in, a, in opposition to, the, to other post-Soviet stunts, let's say, internet has been uh, penetrating fast. It has been also very affordable. It's cheaper. Uh, Kyrgyzstan maintained trade uh, with China, hence the border and the largest market there, blah, blah, blah. But basically that led to people having access to devices and people having access to the internet. Uh, more so than in some other contexts, yeah? Some figures, again, these are questionable, but some figures show up, upwards of 75, 78% internet penetration in Kyrgyzstan. So people have access to the internet, but what do they do with this? Or what kind of content do they have access to through the devices and through the internet connection that they have? In what language is it? In Russian? Is it in Kyrgyz? And when they do get access to that, who, are, who is putting things in perspective for them? I would have to return to that. 
And you know, if you are socializing on Twitter, you are in, in one very distinct bubble. If you're socializing on uh, Instagram and there are, you know, especially mainstream um, singers, mainstream uh, superstars, they might put things in a very different perspective if it's in the Kyrgyz language or if it's in the Uzbek language, yeah, which is the third uh, largest uh, widespread language in the country. Uh, in fact, Uzbek minority is the second largest than Russian. So it depends on the language. It depends on political views. It depends on what bubble you are in, on or offline. And these are very distinct in both domains. And once again, I have friends who have reported that in some now, what's possible in the capital of Bishkek, if you bring up this in conversation in the south of the country, for instance, uh, people might get upset to the point that they'll physically retaliate upon you. And that is also living in the digital domain. Um, but if you re read this, it's, it doesn't mean necessarily that you will pack up your bags and come to the capitals to storm the White House, but it means that maybe you will be uh, deciding in one way or another when it comes to uh, voting or supporting a particular political force. Thank you very much. And thank you all for uh, your uh, interesting talks today. And also thank you, uh, the people at home for uh, your questions and for your attention. And uh, I think we uh, have to get back to work. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining. And once again, thanks to Dumi Generale for making this possible. Enjoy the rest of the week.